Hi, it is Wednesday, September the 20th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. Uh, today we're going to finish Galatians chapter 3 by reading verses 19 to 29. Uh, thus far, pretty much in this letter, Paul has been arguing for uh, righteousness through faith. It's believing in Jesus that sets us right with God, puts us in our best relationship with God, um, not not works righteousness, not doing things. That is to say, following the rituals, customs, uh, rules of the Jewish faith, basically. Um, so he is about uh, faith over, over law. Uh, in fact, suggesting, I think, or implying, um, well, for instance, so, so, so these Christians here, the ones in Galatia, this is a, this is a, a, a Gentile area. Um, so they're, they're, they're Hellenists, they're Greek. And they, um, they have come to God through Jesus as, as uh, shared by, by Paul. So Paul shared with them Jesus. Uh, that revelation brought them to God. So through Jesus, they, now got, they know God. And that was great. However, later, a faction from Jerusalem who are more Jewish believe in Jesus, but think that the best way to be in relation with God is to recognize Jesus, but also to recognize the law of Moses and to be circumcised and to keep kosher and to do all the rites and rituals. Uh, and they have come by and they have convinced many of the Galatians um, to follow. And for Paul, that's, well, there's nothing wrong with the law except that if you're going back to that, it's as if you don't really think Jesus is enough. It's, that's what I, I think is inferred by Paul, that, that it, it's like you don't really believe in, in, in this gospel that I shared with you, um, that, that, that Jesus Christ, um, who, who lived and died and rose, um, and uh, that, that that's not enough. Um, and that that's a problem for Paul. So he's upset about this. I think there's a little ego involved. These people believed him, and now they seem to be looking at something else as well. But, but I think he's also fundamentally convinced that this is the essence um, of the gospel, and they're turning away from it a little bit. Um, at least that's where he, he stands on it. So it's all really about faith in Jesus as opposed to following the law, following the rules. And this is where we pick it up. So it's Galatians 3, 19 to 29. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring would come to whom the promise had been made. And it was ordained through angels by a mediator. Now, a mediator involves more than one party, but God is one. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could make alive, then righteousness would indeed come through the law. But the scripture has imprisoned all things under the power of sin, so that what was promised through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, we are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So Paul is finishing the argument that we started, I think, I guess, yesterday uh, or even the day before that. Um, looking at being um, heirs uh, or Abraham's offspring. If you remember, the covenant between God and Abraham was that, you know, that Abraham's descendants that, you know, that, that would... Um, that God would be with, with, with them. And so in Jewish tradition, that was done in a tribal way. It's one of the reasons that, um, that, uh, that the, the, uh, the people uh, of Israel did not want to be, have their children marrying into other, other communities. Um, they wanted to sort of stay genetically descendants of Abraham. Uh, so that becomes a very, very big thing. Yes, you can sort of maybe convert, work your way in, but the primary, oh, you know, 
the ones who arrived in the Mayflower, the old stock, um, the best of them uh, could trace their family back, right? And uh, I mean, we know that that's an important issue because Jesus, um, you know, is uh, is is born in Bethlehem to to um, assert the fact that his father Joseph is a descendant of David. That's why we had to go to Bethlehem. It doesn't matter. But all of that is to go back to David, which goes back to Abraham. So we got to keep everything together. But Paul is saying, however, that but but if you believe as Abraham believed, then you are his offspring. And Abraham believed without all the rules and regulations. Abraham believed because God spoke to Abraham and Abraham trusted God. So if you trust God, if you trust Jesus, if you trust that Jesus and God are one, all of that, then you are an offspring of Abraham. It doesn't matter who your parents were or your grandparents or your ancestors. What matters is that you have come to faith, you've come to God the same way that Abraham did. God spoke to Abraham. And, and in a sense, God speaks to us in Jesus. So listen, see, hear, and, and you're covered. That's that's sort of a, a simple way of looking at what Paul is saying. Um, and that's what he said there at the end. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Heirs according to the promise. Right. I mean, he also says in that, I mean, it's a famous passage. Um, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. That is sort of put on Jesus. Then there is no longer Jew or Greek. No longer slave or free, no longer male or female. So all of those distinctions, all those identities that we have um, are basically buried under being one with Christ. So these are Greeks. And then there were these Jews, Christian Jews, Greek Christians, um, all of them. Uh, so, so the Christian Jews, though, telling the Greeks that they should be more Jewish. And Paul and Paul said, there, there's no such thing as Jew or Greek anymore. Once you're in Christ, you're in Christ. We're done. So you don't need to be Jewish. You don't need to follow all those rules and regulations. That's what Paul is, is, is asserting. Um, and while we're at it, you know what? Rich or poor, slave or free, male or female, none of those things actually matter. As much as, as much as being one in Christ. And I might wonder about that, you know, in a in a day and age when we when we do talk a lot, uh, at least seem to talk, we seem to talk about it more now than when I was a kid. We do talk about identity and how we identify ourselves uh, in terms of in terms of gender. Um, uh, and you know, and I grew up in what was largely expressed as a binary world. I appreciate that it wasn't actually a lived binary world, but that's the way we talked about it, male or female. Um, so these days, as we talk about male and female and binary and non-binary and asexual and trans and all sorts of different types of identity, and then we talk about sort of um, sexuality and sexual expression, and, 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 and so then we bring in a, a variety of, of, of queer expressions. Um, most people I know who, who, who would identify in, in larger queer community they don't want to be told that they are one in Christ and that their identity doesn't matter. <laughs> oh no, 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 you're no longer male or female. No, 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 no. They're saying no, but but I am. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am a lesbian, or I am a. Um, I am non-binary. It's not that I'm not male or female. And in fact, I am kind of both and neither. Not neither. And you know, you know, people will talk about being gender full, not gender less. Um, people will talk about being all sorts of different types of things, and, and that's important to us. Um, so for Paul to say none of that matters, that's a hard thing for some people here today. And, and I have to wonder about that a little bit too. Paul says that, is that the same thing as me saying, well, you know what, I don't see color. Um, because you know, when we talk about systemic racism and we talk about identity, I, I, I do need to see color. Because, because it's part of who you are and not something that you, you hide. But I think Paul wants us to understand that first and foremost, we belong to God. 
first and foremost, we have found God in Jesus. And then, by the way, those other things, whatever those other things may be. That's when we can get into gender, sexuality, race, um, economic status. I mean, there's so many things that, that identify us and impact on the way that we see the world and the way that we live in the world. Um, and on first blush, it would sound like Paul is saying none of those things matter. There is no longer, right? No longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. I wonder about that. I, I would I would be happier if Paul had said these things are no longer as important as <laughs> the fact that you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourself with Christ. Um, but Paul didn't say that. So I am left to wonder. What would Paul say in the world today? Am I too fixated on a variety of expressions of, of humanity, mine and others? Am I too fixated on those things? Should I just let them all go and just say, oh yeah, but we're all, we're all one in Christ. Um, and then what does that say to the ones who have not been baptized into Christ or clothed themselves with Christ? In fact, um, absolutely will not be clothed in Christ. Um, what does this say to, you know, what does this say about my relationship with my, with my Muslim friends, with my Buddhist friends, with my atheist friends? Uh, what does this say, um, you know, in my relationship with, with my Jewish friends? I mean, um, are we not, am I not community with them too? Are they not in God? May not be in Christ, but can they not also be in God? Um, yeah, I would be, I would be fascinated to hear what Paul might say in the year 2023. Um, or whether Paul would just pack it in and go, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are, there are times that I will read about the early church and oh my God, I mean, listen, Paul is, well, Paul will be martyred and thrown into prison and tracked down and terrible things happen to him. Absolutely. And I'll go, yeah, I know, but you've never had to sit through a board meeting. Um <laughs> You've never had to navigate some of the questions that, 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 that come up. Uh, but in fact, I realized they did come up. They did come up back then too. Paul didn't necessarily write about them, but yeah, they did come up. So I would be curious whether Paul might reconsider these words or whether I need to reconsider mine. Um, something to wonder about. I don't have an answer. Um, now, going back... Um, it's interesting. So, so we try to explain. So, so why the law? That's what he says. Why the law? Well, it was added because of transgressions, which sort of makes it sound like having made a covenant with Abraham, God kind of maybe thought, hoped that we would just get it and we would live into that covenant and we would do it well. We would be good people, but we weren't. And so the law comes because of the transgressions, because we don't live into that covenant. We don't live into that relationship with God. So the transgressions uh, inspire the law. The law is to help us be the kind of people who can live in a relationship with God. And that's where it gets interesting. So Paul would say, help us to be those people, but but not... It, it, it's. It, it's not the being in and of itself. It's helping us to be the kind of people who can have the relationship. It's not the relationship, but it helps us be the people who can have the relationship with God. Because then he says, because the whole thing was that was that uh, the Scripture has imprisoned all of uh, is imprisoned all things under the power of sin, so that what was promised through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So Paul here is implying. That all of this was to help make people ready to experience Jesus. Now, that does again what a lot of Paul's writing do does um, does what a lot of a lot of his other writings does does do. You know what I'm saying? Sorry. Um, this causes this, the same problem that Paul often causes, which for me is as this Christian um, uh, supersessionism, just this idea that the Hebrew faith, the Jewish faith. Uh, was only meant to be a stepping stone to Christianity. Now, 
I don't believe that. So does that put me at odds with Paul? Maybe. People say, well, why won't you believe that? Is it because you're not proud enough of your faith? Um, I might like those very Galatians. You know, well, I'm sort of doing the Jewish thing, so I can be a more complete person. So, Norm, you're still you're doing that ecumenical thing, so that you're not going to offend anybody, be a, a better neighbor, a more complete person, but maybe you should actually just stick to the whole Jesus thing. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I listen to those words. I think about that. But as much as I am convinced that Christianity is my way, that it brings me into my fullest relationship with God, it helps me realize my, my own potential, my own value, my own worth, but also recognize God in the world. Um, Christianity does that for me. But it also keeps me humble enough to acknowledge that I may not have a complete picture. I may not be wrong, but I may not be complete. So I, I have to accept, personally, I accept that there may be other ways to be in a, in, 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 in a relationship with God, a complete relationship with God. And, and, and the Jewish faith is one of those ways. Not mine. But I, I shudder when I hear Paul basically dismissing the Jewish faith as a, as a stepping stone to get to Christianity. I'm not surprised he does it. He was a faithful Jew, right? And and and, and then he had this revelation of Jesus that, that, that changed everything. And now he is a very faithful follower of Jesus, what I would call a Christian. Uh, and so naturally he looks back and goes, yeah, so everything before doesn't matter. Well, maybe not, but everything before did speak to you to a degree, Paul. You might have then heard a louder voice or, or, or seen something more with your experience of Jesus. But it shouldn't throw everything out before. And just because it was more and better for you doesn't mean it's more and better for everyone. Um, and I really do believe that. God invites me into humility. So I don't think that I am weakening my faith if I don't demand that you believe the way that I believe. Um, so I can read this passage and go, yeah, so so what the what 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 the rules and regulations, what the Jewish faith was doing was helping people be the kind of people who could be in a good relationship with God. Good news, along came Jesus, which is sort of a portal into that. Oh my gosh, now that I in Jesus I see God is actually in the world, then great. I am I yeah. You know, being a faithful Jew actually makes it easy for me to live into that. Abs but it doesn't mean I have to live into that. I can also keep going the path that I am going. I am in a relationship with God. Is it the best relationship with God? Is Norm's relationship better you know, than Simon's relationship with God? Hard to know, but I do remember Jesus saying, the last shall be first and the first shall be last, uh, which I don't think means that you know the 12th in line is switched to the first in line and they trade places. I think it reminds us that the last and the first aren't really meaningful things. There isn't a hierarchy. We are all embraced and loved by God. So I think what Jesus, what Jesus, what Paul is trying to say here to the Galatians is, you've already got it. So live into what you have. You know what? There isn't a hierarchy. You're not going to be more faithful by getting circumcised. Um, I mean, fine on them, but that was part of the nature of that relationship. But it's, it's a tricky one because it's easy to sort of say, yeah, so the path that's best for me is the best path for everyone. Um, we all like, a, you know, we, we like it simple. Man, if I just know the best path, I'll just go down that path. I don't have to worry about anything else. I don't know. Best path for you. Oh, man, you mean there's other paths out there? What if I didn't pick the best path for me? Should I, dare I look at it? Well, yeah, what happens if it weakens? What I, we're afraid. I think the fulsome faith, complete faith, is when we're not afraid, not afraid of new ideas, not afraid of anybody else's faith. I, I was <laughs> I was at a meeting um, very, very recently when we're talking about a relationship with 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 uh, with, an, with another group uh, of faithful people, and someone had voiced a fear about what happens if they 
if, if they lead us away from Jesus. Essentially, that's what they said. So if we join with them, I mean, they talk like they're Christians. But what if they're really not and they lead us away from Jesus? And I mean, I, I, <laughs> I kind of want to just sort of scream like, wow, if they can lead you away from Jesus, how, how's your faith working for you? Nobody can, can, can compel you to give up your faith. What works for you works for you, and that's wonderful. And you can you can have it working for you and see what works for other people. And and and, and I think that that's a, a wonderful thing. It's something that, that faith offers us because here's the thing: God is with us. <laughs> God is with me, and with all of us. So I'm not afraid of losing God because you. Where your faith was so compelling, I thought I would maybe come and try that and, and spend some time with you. Oh my God, I lost Jesus on the way. I didn't mean to do that. No, that, that's not how it happens. <laughs> you know? Um, so anyway, that's, yeah. There's one line, before I wrap this up, there's one line in this passage that that is is a little baffling to me. And I know I'm in good company. Um, I mean, I can tell you that back from seminary and I can tell you for the last... 30 years, I've heard this explained differently by so many different people. When I mean different, I mean, I'm talking dozens, maybe hundreds of people. It's verse 20. Um, now, a mediator involves more than one party, but God is one. Um, say what? <laughs> what? So what that means to me right now, again, this is, this is Paul saying the law is fine and good, but it's not as good for him, and therefore for the rest of us as far as he's concerned, but it's not as good as that revelation of, 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 of Jesus. Having experienced Jesus, knowing Jesus and God are one, there it is, you don't need anything else. right? So in that context, a mediator involves more than one party. So to me, what we're talking about here is the covenant. right? The covenant um, that was... Um, delivered to Moses, right? Um, and in some tradition delivered by angels to Moses. Uh, but the fact is, uh, there is this covenant, it's given to Moses, Moses brings it to the people. Uh, and, and, and there is some sense of negotiation being involved in all of that, right? There is some sense of um, I mean, depending on uh, which, which of the stories you read and how you hear the silences in the stories, uh, God saying, okay, so here's what I need you to do. And, and, and the people go, yeah, but we can't, but we want to do this. And then, so there's modification, there's back and forth. I mean, I listen to Abraham and, and God negotiate, uh, over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, I mean, you know, there is that sense in, in, in the law and in, uh, and in Hebrew scripture, in Jewish tradition of negotiating with God. So there's a mediator, Right. And so that's great, but God is one. So for me, that's what Paul is saying is, so the mediated settlement's fine, but it is, it is human and it is divine. But in Jesus, we experience the divine. God is one. There's no, this is not, this was not mediated. This was simply presented. Here is God in the world. There you go. For me, I wonder when Paul feels that that the law is 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 not as good um, as 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 faith. I, I wonder if Paul's perspective is 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 that the law, which again we were told came about you know because of transgressions, the law is is a series of uh, of commandments, practices, ways to help us move closer to God the way for us to be in relationship with God. And so we we work our way through. We navigate these difficulties and we keep talking to God and we negotiate our way forward. So it's us moving towards God and that's what the law is. And it prepares us for, in Paul's eyes, the Jesus moment, which is when God comes to us. The law is us coming to God. And the law is... is, is, is created with us so therefore we have a part in it 
Um, and in that, it, it, it's, it's always going to be a little bit flawed, and it is based on transgressions and, and failing. Therefore, as we heard yesterday, you can never succeed under the law. 613 mitzvahs, you're not keeping all of them. Your priorities are going to mix up. Um, you're always going to fail. You just hope to fail a little bit, not a lot. But you're always going to fail. Um, and that's what happens with this negotiated piece of the law. But God comes to us in Jesus. That's God's action. And it is perfect. It's not negotiated. It's not imperfect. It's not what we try to do. It's what God has done. Um, and we can recognize it because we have followed the law. We have tried all those things. Uh, and so we were ready for it. And boom, there's Jesus. There's God in the world. And we recognize God in the world because of all that time we spent under the law. But now that we recognize God in the world, and because now that God has come to be with us, we don't have to try to get to be with God because we're now together. We're together by God's action. God has come to us in Jesus, revealed God's presence in the world with us here and now, not far off in heaven, not speaking through a prophet, not a burning bush, but here with us. Mediator involves more than one party, but God is one. I think that's, that God is one. That, I think, for Paul is Jesus. That's how I read that passage. I believe that's what Paul believes. And without the prideful peace and the zealotry that makes me want to discount the Jewish faith, I can agree with Paul on that one. That does work for me. Jesus is God in the world. Jesus is God's action. Um, and God's action is absolutely more awesome, more magnificent, more complete than any of my actions could ever be. So now the actions that I take going forward are not a way to earn uh, my place with God or to get closer to God, but they, in fact, my actions now are a reflection of my realizing that God is in the world, and that God loves the world. So now I want to, I want to be part of that. So now what I do, I do in concert with God, not trying to get God's attention. I don't know. That's what I'm thinking about as I, as I hear Paul uh, work his way through. So, you know what, I'm going to call it uh, quits for today because goodness gracious, I've been going on for ages and ages. And I'm going to offer you a prayer. So let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the words of Paul, even when they are difficult. In fact, we might even be particularly thankful because they are difficult and therefore inspire us to wonder. Thank you, God, for the wondering today. We ask that in our wondering, we hear your word, your voice, and that we follow. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's it for me today, but I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Uh, until I get to see you, God bless you. Please know that God sees you and loves you exactly where you are, exactly as you are. And God's love moves through you and out into the world in, in amazing ways. You matter. God bless you. See you tomorrow.